Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Riverside Church. Welcome to everybody in the room. Welcome to those of you tuning in at the, for the first time. It is brilliant that you are with us today. Welcome if it is your first time here. If it's your 156th time here, you are all really welcome. My name is Andy, and this is... Sarah. Good start, isn't it? Uh, so, why don't you tell us what's happened today? I shall. Right. Uh, so, today we've got our final in our series uh, and we of looking at uh, Bend, Don't Break, and Tim is going to be coming and speaking to us about resilience a little bit later on in the service. And we've also got some, some fe- c- celebrations that we're going to be doing this morning. But as we begin our first block of worship, uh, this is the final Sunday where you can write down any questions that you would like to ask our panel next week around this whole topic of uh, mental health that we've been looking at over this uh, last few weeks. So there's some question little cards on your chair and as the bucket goes around later for the offering, please do pop your questions in the bucket. We would love to hear uh, from you for our panel next week. Um, And as we begin this first song of worship, we're going to use this to take up our offering, a chance for us to give back into the work of the church, which you can either use the connection station uh, or as the buckets come past. So why don't we stand as we begin our service this morning? Should I pray for us? Please do stand if you're able. That'd be wonderful. Thank you so much. Brilliant to see you here this morning. And why don't we just take a moment to think about um, how we are doing this morning. Sometimes, you know, sometimes when we say, how are you, we make small talk. We say, how are you? There's two things that we answer. We say, I'm fine, or we say that we're tired. But the Lord sees exactly how you are doing this morning. Let's just be really real and really honest with how are we this morning as we come to worship our Lord. So God, thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you know exactly how we're doing. Thank you, you know everything that's gone on this last week, this last year. And you are not distant, you are right there with us. And as we draw close to you this morning, I pray, Jesus, that we would have a fresh understanding that you are with us every single step of the way in our lives. Because you love us. Amen. Great, let's use this song this morning to lift our eyes and to worship God, to thank him for the um, good things that he's done in our lives. to 
Amen. Amen. Do you have a seat? Thank you so much. Found your mic, sir. Found my All mic. Right. <laughs> Lost my mic for a few nice seconds. Nice to see you this morning. If you just joined us, you are very, very welcome. Now then, last weekend... Can I just say, Andy, just oh, for hello. the people who sat at the back, yes. there are quite a few chairs down the front here and oh, chuck all of our stuff on the fr off the front row. There's another lot here, so please do come and grab a seat. There are quite a lot peppered around come and, and we've a got seat. a few things to do, so make yourselves comfy. Yeah. Um, last weekend was a monumental weekend in the life of Riverside Church because loads of you guys went to see and were involved in an uh, amazing production of Matilda. Who, went, who was in Matilda? Who was in it? Show of hands if you were in it in any capacity, if you were backstage performing. And who went to go and see it? Wonderful. Who, were, who uh, was praying for it? Anybody praying for it? It was absolutely amazing. And do you know what, Sarah? All credit to you. I know it's not just you. Um, you had an amazing team. But the team gave up their Saturday afternoon since October. And so I think we should just give the, uh, the guys, everybody involved, a massive round of applause. <laughs> And you know, we're going to watch a little bit about it. We're a bit emotional talking about it to you once with you. Um, we're going to watch a little highlights video of what happened. Enjoy. We've never been doing with your It's been absolutely amazing. Haven't we, Maggot? Yeah! absolutely amazing just how it builds not only we celebrate like amazing performances from everybody but just the sense of community that is infused in the demonstration of god's love in action just absolutely brilliant so fantastic watch this space for 2025 We've booked the room already. Um, it would be great to keep praying. Lots of our uh, young people and children who connected in through Matilda have started coming along to our youth groups, some of our children's life groups, and we would just love to pray for them as they uh, begin their faith journey in many different ways. But you might have seen on the screen uh, someone who was very much part of Matilda, both in helping choreograph it and backstage it, uh, was our wonderful uh, old head of children's ministries, Sarah Thompson. Um, and this morning is both a celebration, but also a sad morning where we are going to have a chance to say goodbye to Sarah and thank her for everything that she has poured into the life of our children's ministry over the last uh, two and a half years. So before we get Sarah up and hear from Sarah, we just ask a couple of people uh, kind of to send little messages to Sarah. So let's just watch this video now. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Hi Sarah, thank you so much for all your hard work over the past few years. I've really enjoyed working on the team with you and thank you so much for all your support and guidance. I wish you all the best in your next venture. We're going to miss you. Thank you Sarah for all the things you do. Thank you Sarah for all the stuff you have done. We're going to really miss you. Thank you so much for helping us and trying as well. Um, we really loved it. Um, you're great and we'll really miss you. 
I'm Sam, and thank you so much for helping us learn more about Jesus. You're one of the best Sarahs we know. From this year. Thanks for helping so much in at church, and um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Sarah Thompson, for letting us know God better. And thank you for helping us. Sarah, thank you so much for all the time and investment that you've poured into every single child within Riverside and the community. You are absolutely wonderful. I really enjoyed Pancake Day and the Christmas party that we had in small group. You're really helpful. Helpful. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. You've been really encouraging. We're going to miss you. Sarah, thank you for all you've done as head of children's ministry for drawing, drawing our little people closer to God and just for supporting us as volunteers and bringing the team together. Thank you Sarah for helping me to learn about Jesus. Fantastic. Sarah, come on up. <laughs> Sarah, that was just a few. <laughs> that was just a few moments of thank you. But um, we've also got some cards down here. There are all the different children's groups. There's also um, a card for grown-ups to sign. So we would love you um, during the next block of worship or at the end of the service just to come and leave your little messages for Sarah, and we will pass those on to her. Um, Sarah, before um, we let you sit back down again, um, what have been your highlights? Because you've been brilliant. Um, being called one of the best Sarahs that <laughs> somebody knows, it's been brilliant. Um, no, but there have been so many highlights. Um, I think where I'm at today, it just feels, sorry, I'm emotional. When you said, how are you feeling? Emotional. Um, it's just been an amazing two years. I feel like it's, it, I've just had the best time. Um, and I'm really sad today, not because I'm leaving, because I'm not really leaving, I'm still here. And I feel like this job has just been, I've been part of this wonderful family of Riverside and I've just stepped into a role and now I'm stepping back into the family. So I don't feel like I'm leaving at all actually. Um, and I'm so excited for the future of our children's ministry. The highlights have been the big things like React and the kids weekends and Pancake Day and Matilda but also just those really special everyday moments of playing with children, of talking to them about what's going on in their lives and of telling them a bit about Jesus. It's just been an amazing privilege. And also, just to, to go on a little bit further, um, our church talks about, we've got a generations team and we talk about putting young people and children in the centre. Um, and they don't just say that as a, as a church, Riverside, we do that. And it's just been a privilege to work in an environment where that is happening um, every day. And, and also to have a team of people. The team we have is incredible. The people who look after your children and young people and teach them and disciple them and just be friends to them is incredible. So thank you to the team and thank you to the Aramaisa leadership for just putting kids at the centre of church. I'll share it now. <laughs> So we think you're absolutely amazing and it's just been such a blessing and it's not goodbye because you're still going to be part of our lovely church family, as you said. Just got a few things for you. Um, um, Andy's going to pray for Sarah. I wondered whether, so yeah. it happens off camera, Sarah, do you want to come down to the middle here? And if there are any children or young people who have kind of been working with Sarah, do you just want to come and gather around her while Andy prays? Lovely. So that she knows that you're kind of, so just go and gather around her. Well Brilliant. done, young people. Well done, guys. Lovely. Brilliant. So lovely to see. <laughs> All right, let's just thank God for Sarah Thompson. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you so much for all our amazing children and all our amazing young people who are part of this fabulous church. And God, we want to honour Sarah today. God, we want to mm. thank you for her. Thank you for the hours and hours of time that she has given to these brilliant children. Thank you for the laughs. Thank you for her wisdom. Thank you for her creativity. And God, thank you that you have got the best in store for Sarah. So God, we pray your blessing on her today. And may she hear not only our thank yous, but her heavenly father's whispering to her here, well done, my faithful servant. So thank you for Sarah Thompson today. And we say amen. Three cheers for Sarah Thompson. Hip hop. Hooray. Hip hop. Hooray. 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 Hooray.
just before our children and young people go out to their groups and we'll let you know where they're going if you are visiting us this morning. Uh, we also wanted to let you know what is next in the chapter for the Riverside Children's Work. We are delighted to announce this morning that our new head of children's ministry is going to be Leah Wilson. And she is... <laughs> She is going to be supported in her role by Ella Wilkes, who will now become our assistant children's worker. We're going to get a chance to pray for both of them in a few weeks, but we are really excited to hand the mantle over to such a fantastic team. Um, as we go into this block of worship now, if you are uh, between the ages of 0 to 14, then we have groups for you. Uh, at the back, there are leaders who are holding up signs for the groups. If you're new or visiting us this morning, uh, do go. So years three and four are going through this door. Preschool years five and six are going through uh, this door and... Uh, I think, is that everybody? We covered all groups. And youth are also going through that door. Please do just go and say hi to a leader if you're a parent of somebody who is visiting this morning. And for the rest of us in the room, why don't you just turn and say hi to someone next to you for a few seconds. Kids, you're amazing. Have a great morning. God bless. Please do grab a chair if you can. Have a fantastic time as you continue as you go out. Marvellous. in the room we are going to continue with our time of sung worship so if you're able can I invite you to stand as Alice continues to lead us in worship let's just pray as we enter into another time of worship Lord Jesus we praise you this morning we thank you that as we've just looked at and celebrated all the good things that you're doing in our community, in our church family, that you're a God that is at work within us, a God that is present. We lift your name this morning and we worship you, King of Kings, Almighty God. God of miracles, God of wonders, yet who also knows us and calls us your children. We praise you this morning.
Lord Jesus, we love you. And Heavenly Father, we worship you today. And we give you thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Please do have a seat. Thank you. One of um, the brilliant things I love about Riverside is the sense of family that we have. The sense of sharing in each other's joys. But also, the flip side of that is sharing in some sad family news as well. I'm just going to welcome Judy. Yeah, I was just reflecting on that sense of family and the joys uh, and the sorrows, as Andy said. And um, we did receive some sad but wonderful news in some ways. And that was that our lovely Pierre, uh, as in Stephen Pierre Price, uh, went to be with Jesus on uh, Monday afternoon. Uh, some of you will know that she was diagnosed two and a half years ago, uh, given a terminal cancer diagnosis and given weeks or even months to live. And she's lived on for two and a half years in the most amazing way. And many of you will remember her and Steve sharing their story not long ago, uh, just about their times of closeness to the Lord, their times of worship. Uh, I was privileged um, one of the times that they had a worship session in their house, uh, just the two of them and Susie Muneer and, and me praising God together. And the presence of God in the room was just absolutely incredible. Um, and so we are absolutely confident that Pierre has gone to be with Jesus. But obviously for Steve, he's bereft. Uh, they are such team. Uh, I think he might join us actually for second service. Uh, but we we just wanted to really lift them up in prayer now. Uh, and uh, I don't know if Steve's joining us online, but I would love us to stand together. And uh, I'd love to just pray for Steve and the two sons uh, and all those who loved Pierre. Um, she was an incredible woman. And uh, a few years ago, we did a course called Dying Well um, with Real Hope and Courage. And she epitomized that in the courage uh, that she showed at the end and the, the peace that even the paramedics commented on on her face as she passed. So let's just have a moment's pause and then I'd love to pray. Lord, in your word, we read that there is a time and season for everything under heaven. And Lord, we do mourn today the loss here on earth of lovely Pierre. But we also celebrate the fact that she is with you eternally now, that she is free from pain, she is free from trauma, she is free from fear, that she is free, that she dances with her saviour even now. And Lord, you promise too that we do not mourn as those without hope. But that we grieve knowing for Steve, for their two sons, for the whole family, that Pierre is with you. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who has just heard this news for the first time or, or online. Lord, would you enfold them? Would you wrap them around with your comfort today? Lord, you are our comfort as we mourn. Unite us, Lord, in loving Steve well, in supporting him where we can. May we excel in loving you and loving them. We ask all this in your beautiful name, Lord Jesus, the name above all names. Amen. 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 We are uh, currently in a uh, sessions looking at bend, don't break. What is it to have to have good mental health? How can we look after ourselves? And Tim is going to speak to us in a moment. But before he does, I'm just going to pray for Tim. Lord Jesus, thank you for Tim. And I pray, Jesus, that you would be with him this morning. Thank you for how he models resilience. And I pray, Jesus, your blessing on him. And God, I pray for all of us here. 
however we're feeling at the moment, if we're feeling really unresilient or if we're doing all right, God, I pray that you'd come by your spirit and speak to us all in this room today and also at home as well. Amen. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all of their sins. Well, good morning, friends, both here in the room and for those who are joining us online if you haven't been with us over the last couple of weeks do check back on youtube to see the last two weeks in this series called ben don't break looking at mental health emotional well-being and as we kick off i wonder if you've ever been in one of those situations where you've been on a journey but you've been really unprepared for that journey. Perhaps in what, you've wo- what you were wearing, maybe you were wearing flip-flops trying to walk a mountain, or maybe you were out for a walk in your lovely new Gucci sweater, and then it absolutely pours. I have a friend who was unprepared. He was going to do a marathon, worked in London, and it was one of these overnight marathons starting late in the evening, uh, and he went to work on that Friday uh, and forgot all his kit, and so basically had a choice. Do I keep on trying to do the marathon, or do I not? And forfeit it and he thought well I'll give it a go so he went to do the marathon in his suit very unprepared got through with, with quite a few chafing moments for those that have ever done <laughs> for ever those that have ever done a marathon but I wonder if for many of us life is like that that there are seasons times some of us even decades where we feel so unprepared for what life is throwing at us where the journey that we are on is very different to what we were expecting and we feel we can't navigate it with the kit or the equipment that we've got. Well, as we continue this series called Bend, Don't Break, today we're thinking about what it looks like to be well prepared on the journey of life. And in the last two weeks, we've helpfully debunked a few myths about mental health. And then last week, beautifully, Judy helped us to how do we respond when we're actually really struggling, and perhaps even at breaking point. And today, we're thinking, we're changing gears slightly, and we're thinking about what it looks like to cultivate resilience in our lives. Now, I know that for some of us, even that word resilience is a word that we have heard that feels like it's a bit of a stick to beat us with. In a work context, come on, you need to develop resilience. Or even some of us have been told by our friends, those closest to us, come on, you just need to be a bit more resilient, toughen up a bit. And so even today, as we're thinking about resilience, we are worried. And can I say, please, don't hear that this morning. This morning is not a stick to beat us with. If you're hearing the title of this series, Bend, Don't Break, as a You Shouldn't Break, please, that's not what the title's about at all. Rather, the title is about, for those of us who know, we can see signs in our life, we may not yet be at breaking point, or even if we can't see signs, we just wonder if we actually need to cultivate resilience so that we don't, if at all possible, get to breaking point. For those of us right now who we know there are things that we could change, little moments to change, to help cultivate resilience in a healthy way. That's where we're going uh, today. 
And to kick us off every week, we've been looking at some different stories. And we're going to share a little story from Linda, who's not with us today. Uh, Linda is, a, is a part of a wider story, but we've got a little moment which she speaks very beautiful, uh, beautifully about navigating some of the most challenging times in life. Let's listen to Linda's story. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Linda. I've been part of the Riverside family since the very beginning. I was in a situation where I felt completely overwhelmed. It was a family situation. I was crying out to God, why is this happening to me? Um, I can't deal with it. I thought it must be because I was a rebellious teenager, because I was a failure as a mother. And then very clearly, and not out loud, but like a shout in my mind, I heard God say, because I trust you. And that wasn't something I, I could have made up. He said, he trusted me. He trusted me with the situation, with the person that I was dealing with. And it changed the whole perspective of my life. I realized God wasn't punishing me. Um, it wasn't that God didn't care. And incredibly, God had chosen me to walk this difficult walk. Now, it didn't make it easier, but it somehow had a different shape around the, the situation rather than feeling like the whole of life was going to, to crack, crack up and break down. Suddenly I knew that God was with me in it. A bit like Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with me. And that was really um, a, a key point in my life. Now, 25 years on, the journey is actually just as difficult. There's still situations going on. But I've learned that walking with God is like climbing a mountain. You start in the foothills, you know, it's lovely. There's a, there's a smooth path. There's a lovely babbling brook next to you. There are lush trees and growth, and it's all beautiful. And as you carry on, the incline starts to get a bit steeper, but you can manage it. It's still fine. But then it gets rockier and harder and steeper, harder to keep going but you're still doing okay. And you reach then the point where you feel I cannot go on. It's got so steep and so hard and you stop and you think I can't do this. And you catch breath and to have a rest and you turn around and then you look and you see the view and you see how far you've come. And it's amazing. And somehow when you see how far you've come, you know there is no going back. You've made it so far. And somehow that inspires you to keep going to the end. And as I'm reaching a certain age, for me, the end is being with Jesus for eternity. That becomes more and more where I'm going. It's the hope that keeps me going. So thank you for listening. I love... I love that image of the journey of life being like climbing a mountain. Um, and sometimes uh, we feel like the image on the right, where it's all good. We're with others, those closest to us. The sun is shining. It's beautiful. We're resting. We're looking out. But other times it feels a bit like the image on the left, where we feel very alone and it feels very precarious. And we feel that we may not make it and one wrong step could lead to disaster. And the passage of the Bible, Psalm 130, that was read to us earlier, it is a beautiful psalm that is one of what are called the Psalms of Ascent. If you, in the Bible, if you've got it on your phone or looking at it in the Bible uh, at home, at the beginning it says, after Psalm 130, it says, a song of ascents. And probably what this was is a number of psalms from Psalm 120 onwards, where people, as the pilgrims went to Jerusalem to the festivals, these were the songs they sang as they walked up to the Jerusalem on the hill. And the Bible has some hugely helpful things for us today as we talk about cultivating resilient lives three different ways we're going to cultivate resilience. And we're going to get to the psalm in a moment. But can I say, as we jump into these three things, uh, it's occasional where as a preacher you're speaking and you feel completely ill-equipped to preach on the subject that you are doing, even though you've planned a series. <laughs> much of this I know in theory, and much of it I do not put in practice. And I long to develop more resilience in my life. 
hear my heart as we're going through. This is not me saying, come look at how I do it. We are a community, a church family, including you guys at home. Let's walk together in this so that we might cultivate resilience together as friends, as sisters and brothers. And can I say, if you are at that stage where it's, in a sense, you wish you had cultivated more resilient lives earlier, and you know you're way beyond that, and these little things may not help that much, as we've said every week, please do seek real help, professional help if needed. So firstly, here's the first way we might cultivate resilience. And it's this, cultivating phys- physical resilience. The MIND website, MIND is the mental health charity. They've got this brilliant phrase it's on the screen. The brain is like an engine. If you run it too hot all day, every day, without checking the oil and water, it breaks, like every part of your body. If you kept on running and running and running and running and running, eventually it would break. And there is this key reality for some of us that a way to cultivate resilience is less in the big themes and more in just some physical activities, being outdoors more, cultivating healthy patterns of regular sleep, looking at our diet, exercise, all are essential, not extras that we can sort of excuse in our 21st century world. During COVID, two-thirds of British people said that regular exercise was what helped their mental health during the pandemic. Like all aspects of our body, we grow and we develop resilience as we flex muscles. But we might think, well, that's great, but that doesn't sound very spiritual. We're in church, Tim. But I think we overlook some of the bits where God talks very clearly about physical well-being. I love the story of Elijah. Elijah is under immense pressure, fleeing, being chased. We've got this beautiful moment in the book of 1 Kings in the Old Testament, which is the kind of half of the Bible before Jesus. And there's this moment where he's in real turmoil. It says this, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush. Not sure what that is. I don't think it's a bush made out of brooms. Anyway, he sat down under it and prayed, prayed that he might die. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel, God is in this place, touched him and said, get up and eat. (laughs) He looked around and there by his head was some bread bread baked over hot coals and a jar jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. Friends, can I say some of us know deep down we just need to physically rest and have decent diet, stop the Mackie D's for a while, whatever it might be, just rest. A book came out uh, recently by a sleep scientist called Why We Sleep, the guy called Matthew Walker. And in it, he particularly zooms in, obviously, on sleep. And this is what he says. Sleep is the single most effective thing we can do to reset our brain and body health each day. So it can be easy to think about all the spiritual things, all the amazing, profound things. But frankly, some of us need to cultivate regular patterns of sleep. And apparently the research says it is the regularity that is key as well as the length. Sleep is, if you like, is our nightly declaration that we aren't God because we let God do the healing in our body, let God take care of all the other things. Now I know some of us, this is a massive issue and a real battle for which we need extra help. But for some of us, we know this is one area that we could do a little bit of work relatively simply to help our own emotional and mental well-being. So when was the last time you just rested? With all of the things that you have to do, when was the last time you just went for a little walk or had a good meal or just snoozed in an afternoon? Physical resilience. The second thing is this then. As well as cultivating physical resilience, I think there's a really important thing about cultivating what you could call relational resilience. 
And in the psalm that was read, there were two aspects to this about the way we relate to other people. There is the importance of us giving out and serving others and the importance of having those around us who give out and serve us. Here it is in Psalm 130. Do you notice the two little bits? The psalmist writes, so that we can with reverence serve you. It's really important, he says, to be involved in giving out. And some things that, one of the things that can go so quickly when we're navigating emotional or mental challenges is that it very quickly becomes about me. And yet we, a great way is to serve others, to develop <coughs> that resilience, to keep on thinking of others' needs. But then also that's the phrase where he talks about, I wait for the Lord more than watchmen long for the morning. If you imagine that phrase, imagine in the army, the military, you've got that group of soldiers and one of you is watchmen. The rest can sleep. And imagine how terrifying it must be. I saw a movie years ago about Vietnam. How terrifying it would be if you're the one who's on the watch in the middle of the night and you know you are responsible for those around, so you've got to stay awake. How desperate would you be for the dawn and that first flickering moment where light begins to come on? We'll come to that in a moment. But there's an element, therefore, of who is your watch person? Who have you got around you that is that watch person? This great quote from a beautiful book by a guy named Mark Maynell, which he called when he talks from the psalm we looked at last week, it's called, When Darkness is My Only Friend. I love this quote. I desperately needed people living in the real world, in the same world as me. Above all, I needed friends, not fixers. Who is it in your world who is just a friend, who will love you and walk with you in the good times and the challenging ones? I remember when my wife Claire was navigating her cancer, I had a mate who phoned me regularly every Saturday morning. Say, how you doing, mate? Sometimes it was just banter. Sometimes it was just how you doing. But regularly, I didn't ask him to. Beautiful act of being a friend. Who have you got? And I think for some of us, we think, well, it's fine for them. They've got a partner or they've got a family or they've got friends. But actually, that's where church comes in. And I wonder if in our culture, some of us, we may have marriages where we're struggling a bit because we've presumed that this idea of the soulmate means that that person has to be all. And therefore, we've let slip cultivating our other friendships, our other relationships. Part of the beauty of church is getting to give out to serve others, to put others' needs before us, as well as therefore having others around us that will be our rock when we're beginning to crumble. And can I say at this moment, I know, because I know a few of you, some of us are rescuers. So that quote about not being fixers, we struggle with it because we see a person that we love and we want to help. And some of us know that therefore we are so much rescuers that we will be willing to sacrifice self in an unhealthy way. I love this Charlie Mackersy moment. You've seen them all, I'm sure. You're so kind to me, said the boy. I hope you're as kind to yourself. And if you've ever been on an aeroplane, you know there's that moment where they're doing the prep work and if, a, if the oxygen masks come down and it says, if you are a parent, put your own mask on first before you try and put your child's mask on. Some of us need to hear that today, that we know the person we are walking with, maybe even the person we are married to, someone in our friendship group or family that we are supporting, that are really struggling. And we know we can see the signs in our own self that we're beginning to struggle emotionally or mentally as a result. Friends, put the oxygen mask on yourself. Maybe a question for the panel next week. How do we do that? Well, so physical resilience, relational resilience, and then finally then, I think there's something really clear in the pages of the scripture about cultivating spiritual resilience. Some of this might be difficult to say, but I'm going to say it. I thought the way Linda beautifully reflected on this I am convinced after many years of leading pastorally, but also in my own life, that actually some of God's most beautiful work is done in the deepest darkness. And some of us in that place of darkness, 
cry out, God, where are you? And wonder if therefore it's somehow our fault or if he's abandoned us. And actually, the opposite is true. You may not feel his presence, but he is doing beautiful, deep work in you. Listen to the psalmist. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. That word depths is like a storm. You can imagine it deep, deep down. This is deep darkness, deep pressure, deep brokenness. He's drowning with life. And every little wave, every little hit just goes over his mouth and is too much. So out of the depths, he cries out to God. I saw a documentary a little while ago on drowning. And it was really, really interesting. Uh, And I say this to us as a church community. Because I think some often we hear, we think those who are most close to drowning are the ones who are crying out most desperately. Uh, But all the research says those closest to drowning have then been silent because all their energy needs to go into trying to do all they can to keep their head above the water. And it may be that some of us are aware there are people around us who've given up crying, given up shouting out. And perhaps they need a little call or a visit or just a chat or a walk, whatever it might be. And part of the challenge of our age, I think, both in church world and in society in general, particularly for people of my generation. I'm in my 40s, if you want to kind of work out what that is. I know I look like I'm in my 60s. Um, Thank you very much. Part of the challenge of our day, I think, is the desire and the expectation that life should be full of adventure, success, pleasure, and comfort. Perhaps we've got the idea that when life isn't that, it's somehow unusual. And therefore, either we internalize it as our fault, something we've done, like Linda said, or we blame others. Whereas in reality, perhaps we all need to expect and normalize difficulty in life. Friends, if you've never really gone through a season of real hardship, you are quite unusual. Be thankful, and it may come. And friends, if you are right now, you are not alone. You are with the vast majority of the planet. As Samuel Beckett says in his play, Endgame, you're on earth. There's no cure for that. Now hear this, please. I'm not downplaying the challenge of our mental health at moments like that, but what I am trying to do is to free us at that moment where we're most desperate, to free us from the idea that somehow it's something we have done or it's our fault or unusual. I love this quote from Herman Bavinck. The human heart in which God has put eternity is so huge that all the world is too small to satisfy it. Even if everything goes hunky-dory and beautifully well, it will never be enough for us. And so the psalmist says, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits for him and in his word. I put my hope. There's two aspects to that. Firstly, for some of us, putting our hope in his word is a simple reminder for some of us how important it is to regularly be reading the Bible. Not out of duty. I know the moment we say that, some of us hear, oh, pressure, pressure, duty, duty, duty. No. It's just so that in those dark times, there's a rhythm and a pattern so that hope can still come in because of a resilience that has been cultivated. Cling on to those promises in the Bible that some of you know. And if you're new to faith or you're just exploring it, friends, the Bible has been tried and tested for thousands of years by huge amounts of humanity. It is worth giving a go, friends. Way better than the latest self-help book, dare I say. But there's a different kind of word in which we put our help. Not just the pages in the Bible. In the beginning of John's Gospel in the New Testament, which is the bit about Jesus... We read this, the word became flesh 
and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's talking about Jesus. And so as we look at Jesus, it changes how we see our lives and even changes our resilience. I want to just mention for a moment those of us within Riverside who might be experiencing what you could call moral injury. Now, I don't know if you know what that is. Moral injury is when you are involved in a system in which you are committing acts that cause you moral harm, or you're in a system where the moral harm has been done against you. And I hear this a lot from those who are in education, those who are in the healthcare profession, those who are in local authority stuff, where you know very well that all you want to do in your job will never be enough to provide for what you long to do. And even some of you, you know the system that you're in is somehow provide, causing harm and it causes you emotional distress. How do we navigate that, friends? We look at, at Jesus. Why? Well, the psalmist goes on. I love this. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. Put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love and with him is full redemption. Friends, if you are overwhelmed with either guilt or shame yourself because of your own circumstances or even the system you're part of, see who God is. See the God on the cross who is full of unfailing love never-ending compassion to you as well as to those you're trying to serve. The good news of Jesus is not that we have profound certainty in him. The good news of Jesus is in his unfailing love for us. And I know some of us in the darkest moments, wondering if our faith is faltering, or maybe even we're kind of exploring God, but we know our past. And we're wondering whether I've done too much. My past is too bad. Hear these words. Put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is, is unfailing love. And with him is full redemption. The hope is in the Lord, not in that the Lord will change circumstances. He is our hope. And as I come to a close... I want to mention something that I'm going to call palliative hope. You'll know the difference between, I don't know, I'm not a professional, kind of normal medicine and palliative medicine. Normal medicine is trying to fix the problem. Palliative medical care is when the problem can't be fixed, and so it's making the patient comfortable and peaceful as much as possible, even to the point of death. Hope without improvement in circumstances. And I wonder if in our church circles and even in society, yes, we know that God heals. We know that God breaks through. We know that God does amazing miracles. But sometimes he doesn't. And therefore, we need to cultivate a palliative hope. That as Linda said, one day, one day, we will look back and see how far we have come. One day with Pierre. Pierre. Dancing, rejoicing before the Jesus who rose from the dead. One day with our frail emotions, our frail mental health, our frail bodies, we will see Jesus in all his glory. That kind of hope that carries us through regardless of his circumstances change. As I close, I love this quote from Japanese theologian, Kasuke Kiyama. He imagines us at the end of our lives, coming face to face with Jesus, and he imagines what Jesus will say. Beautiful words that some of you need to hear. You've had a difficult journey. You must be tired and dirty. Let me wash your feet. The banquet is ready. Shall we pray? I'm going to invite the band up. And we're going to respond together. You may find it helpful to close your eyes. We're going to be still. We're going to ask God to...
continue the work that he's doing. You may find it helpful even to hold open your hands. In a moment, the band are going to lead us as we sing, and I'm going to invite the prayer team to head to the back. We believe that Jesus is present here by his spirit. The miracle working breakthrough God. And that even today, there may be breakthroughs that he wants to do in your life. And so we're going to ask for that. And alongside that, we're also going to ask for the supernatural ability to keep on, keeping on, clinging on to the hope that is only in Jesus. So I pray now, Lord God, by your spirit, would you have your way in our own lives for those who today needs to hear that overwhelming word of unfailing love right now, Lord God. Would you show how loved we are? That all that shame, all that guilt, all that pressure, all that responsibility, that you see them as a loving child, your child. And for those of us who are walking right now through huge pressure and we've heard that word of hope, even now, Holy Spirit, would you help us to trust in you? The one who walks with us, walks before us and has got a place ready for us. Have your way, we pray, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Give grace, we pray. So we're going to respond together. The band are going to lead us as we sing, and I'd love the prayer team to gather right now at the back. Do come and pray. God is in the business of mending broken hearts and strengthening feeble bones. So let's pray together, let's worship. Shall we stand if you're able to?
we were just um, singing the words of that song and I just um, sense whether this is for some of us in the room or whether this is for someone joining us at home that actually right now you do feel like you're in the valley but you have never really considered that God is there with you. That as we see these words, you're holding on to me. Actually, maybe you have never considered that God is there and he is holding on to you because you've never made that decision to say, please come into my life. And I'm just going to pray now, and that might be for someone who wants to just go and stand with a member of the prayer team, just to say, I feel like I'm in the valley. I don't know what it is to know God in that valley with me, but I want to know what it is to know God in that valley with me. Because as I've heard this morning, this is a relationship that is here for every single one of us, from our youngest to our eldest. So God, I pray for those of us who this morning feel like we're in the valley, but we've never really known what it is to know that you are thy right there beside us. And so God, as we are there, where it feels like the walls are enclosing around us, I thank you that you are there too. That you say that your son came to this earth to be in a relationship with every one of us. That this is on offer to every one of us. Whatever our age, whatever our background, whatever we've done, whoever we are, God says this morning, I see you but I don't just see you, I sit with you. And that moment that you open your hands and say, please come and be in my life, I am there because the love that I have for you is bigger than you could possibly, possibly imagine.
Lord Jesus, when we're in the valleys, when we're crawling up the mountains, may we know that as we leave this place today and through our own lives at work, at school, whatever we're doing, that you are with us because you love us. Amen. Please do have a seat. Fantastic. We have come to the end of our service now. The prayer team are still there, though, so please do go and pray with them if you would like to. Um, all of the information about announcements that we're going to give you can find on our website. That's also the place to go if you would like to find out any more information about the church or the life of the church. If you're new or visiting us this morning, we'd love to say hi, let you know a little bit more about the life of the church. Nathaniel is over there. Can give us a little wave. Uh, Nathaniel would love to meet with you and welcome you after the service. So please do go and find Nathaniel smiling happily over there. I'm loving all these balloons. I want a balloon. Can someone, um, someone tell me what a balloon what, was for? What was what the balloons for? So those who join us at home, lots of our young people have come in with, with balloons and they've been thinking balloons. about that balloons, when they're filled, are like us when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Just to say, at one o'clock today as well, if you aren't, haven't got any plans for lunch, you're really welcome for our open lunch. Please do come and join us. not just about the amazing food, it's about the amazing community as well. If you have no plans, do come and join us. One o'clock today, Sarah. We are currently looking for a new head of design and communication. Uh, so if you would like to apply for that or you know someone who you think might be interested in that, please head to our website and uh, you can see the vacancy and all of the job advert on there. And then finally to say, uh, please do come and write your messages for Sarah Thompson, all ages, there are some pens out there. Uh, we'd love you just to write a little message in her card for her. And also, please do get your questions down for the panel next week. Next, whoa, oh, there goes the water balloon. Um, do uh, write down your questions for the panel next week. Any question is absolutely valid. It has been a fantastic morning. Uh, praying for you as you leave today. May you know that God is with you no matter what. Have a fabulous rest of your day. And go and help yourself to tea, coffee and all the biscuits before the kids get in there through the doors on the left-hand side. God bless. See you later. Bye.